Okay, before we begin the Gemara, of course today is the 11th of Shvat, just to share a little, share a little bit about that. The 10th of Shvat, of course, marks the anniversary of the passing of the previous Rebbe in 1950. And after a year of reluctance, on, 19, on the 11th of Shvat, technically, meaning the night following the 10th of Shvat, when there was a fabreng and a gathering to commemorate the first anniversary of Passover, the first yard site of the previous Rebbe, they were formally accepted the leadership of, uh, of Chabad. And the way he did that was by reciting a Hasidic discourse teaching Torah anyone can do, and setting a Hasidic Torah course is reserved for a Rebbe. So when he said that discourse, that was uh, his way of announcing his accepted leadership. I mentioned this at the Fabrengen last night, it occurred to me that it's kind of, um, I don't think ironic is the right word, but it's, it's interesting to note that usually when someone takes a job reluctantly, they'll do it to the minimum of their ability. I'm taking, uh, compelled to take a job and I don't really want to do it, I'll just do it if you're designing it. It's just to fulfill my obligation, I'll do it. If you hear the Rebbe is refusing to become the leader, takes it on reluctantly, so to speak, you know, air quotations, and then, and then takes it on with like immense, uh, uh, similar pattern to Moshe Rabbeinu, reluctantly. Right, so first he's, exactly like Moshe Rabbeinu, first he uh, is telling God that he can't speak, yeah. and by the time he's done, he's forcefully telling God to, forcefully, so to speak, to protect the Jewish people. So there's this, it's a pattern, I guess, in Jewish leaders. Yes, it's humility. It's a sense of humility. No. But if we're taking it, it's with Hashem's yeah. power, it goes with the whole, you know, even right at the, right at the Rebbe's inaugural address, and the Rebbe's, uh, this Maimon, this discourse, talk about the mission of the seventh generation of Chabad, he has no illusions about it. Yeah. This is straightforward. We're bringing the presence of Hashem down to this earth. There could be no taller order than that to take upon yourself. It's interesting. The best judges <clears throat> and statesmen in history have been those who want the job. And they didn't want the job, yeah, exactly. The best, statement, best statesmen are those who don't yeah, want the best job. Yeah. and judges. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe because of the fact that they didn't want the, what, they call, what, what people used to think as power, yeah. which is not power at all, but res- pure, just pure responsibility. Yeah. Because so it's I guess the if office you, of what you do. Right. It's not you. If, it's, if you want it, yeah. then inevitably you're taking the position for something you want out of it. Exactly. Whereas if you're taking it... Be- out of reluctance, you're taking it because the office needs you, exactly. then you're there in the service of what you're... Our best judges are those who never wanted to. It's not that the op- yeah. responsibility is too awesome. Yeah. So I guess that's the model. Um, so after the Rebbe, of course, there was a big commotion. With Rebbe, as soon as they ever started, you can hear in the uh, audio recording, as soon as they ever starts giving the mimer, there's a special tune to the way a mimer is delivered, and you know, there's a commotion already in the crowd. People are like, oh, he's, he's saying a mimer, he must, you know, he's accepting the leadership. And people got up and wished Mazel Tov after it was done. So afterwards, the Rebbe, like the Rebbe said, that in America, the custom is, when you're about to take on a project, you have a mission statement. So I formally accepted the leadership, so now I'm making him my mission statement. And this is the Rebbe's mission statement that he made, that he said then. He said that a Jew has Sholish Avas, three loves, three things that, he's, that he ought to love. Love of Hashem, love of God, Love of Torah and love of the Jew. So, what's my mission statement? Says the Rebbe, like the my no, mission statement is the right word. I'm use the word mission statement, but yeah, okay. mission statement. It's a like like a uh, like a mo, you know. Is that the, these three loves are all one and the same? Love of God, love of Torah, and love of Jew is one and the same love. One cannot claim to have one and say I excel here, or I or I even have this partially, but I don't have the other. And unfortunately, we can see. All three of these failures, this Debra doesn't say, but this I'm adding, that those who, yeah, don't give me this whole Judaism business, doing this ritual, that ritual, studying, I love God, you know, meditative somewhere, somewhere, you know, I love God, I love God. No. God, His Torah, and His people are all one. We can't claim to love God and not love His Torah and people. It's actually the Zohar. Yeah, it's based on the Zohar, which says that all three are one, Torah, Hashem, and the Jew are all one, are not separatable. Three, three, uh, three, they're one. They're one entity. Likewise, a person says, I love Torah. I love studying Torah. Don't bother me with helping other Jews. So it's not as if he has Torah, but he's lacking in the help of other Jews. No. Even his Torah is in question. If his love of Torah does not also come with love of another Jew, then it's not simply he's lacking another detail. His love of Torah is in question. And likewise, a person who comes and says, I, I help people. I help people. This is my thing. I do chesed. I, I like to help people. Study Torah doing things for Hashem, 
not my business. So this is also a problem. Torah and Muslim all come together. Love of Hashem, love of Torah, love of Jews are all one of the same. And this is this is Deborah's mission statement. This is what this is the underpinnings of of the Shlichus movement, the Chabad movement, going all over the world to help other Jews. It's not like uh, for the Rebbe, this is like a, a nice addition to Judaism. You have a nice Judaism on your own, and you go help other Jews. It's a nice addition. It's a nice bonus, or because they need you. No, if your serv- if your religion is in the service of Hashem, then it's in the service of His people. And going to help somebody in the middle of nowhere, far out there, is not a nice addition to to your Judaism. This is the Judaism. If you're serving God, then you're serving His people, and you're serving His Torah. It's all one and the same. This is there was mission statement that uh, as he laid it out in his in that, uh, right after his inaugural address th- that discourse. Okay, now to the Gemara. So first, I want to add something we talked about uh, two days ago. So first, I, I noted in the picture that the uh, there's a flower knob and cup that were stacked upon each other in between the base and the first set of two branches that come out. Right? Remember that? I'm uh, sure if you want to get the picture. Teaching aids. Yeah. <coughs> so I noted that in the picture there, they say that they're all stacked above each other, whereas Rashi says, Rashi's commentary on our Gemara says that all three came out of different sides, or maybe the knob in the middle and the flower and the cup coming on the other side. Yeah. Now the truth is that the Rambam actually says that they were specifically stacked on top of each other. Now there are those who suggest that perhaps the reason why Rashi says uh, they come out of different sides as opposed to stacked is because the Gemara notes that all three have to be one in one tefach and one hand breadth. Now if you go up the Minerva, the the knob from which the two branches come out itself only takes one tefach, which would mean the knob below in the Rambam's view, flower, uh, knob, cup stacked above each other would be much smaller than the other ones because they have to fit inside of a tefach. So perhaps for that reason Nashi says they're not stacked upon each other but they're on the sides of each other so that uh, they all fit in one tefach. That's perhaps the first thing I want. That's what I wanted to share with you. About here, yeah. So this one here, they have the cup, flower, and knob stacked above each other. Whereas in Rashi's view, they're all coming out the sides. Also, I should note, over here they have the cups all facing upward. And they claim that this is the Rambam's view. Deborah points out that if you look at the Rambam's actual drawing of the Menorah in his book of Allah, he includes a drawing, and that's the drawing. You can cl- see clearly he's making upside down triangles, mm. which would clear, which would indicate quite clearly that in his view, it's like not like some of them are like that. Every single cup he has, right? First, you can see here the cup, nub, and flowers that are stacked above each other; they're a little smaller than the rest of them. But these ones here, and all of them, the cups are all upside down: the wider at the bottom and the narrow at the top. But then Rambam himself, the, the, the actual Torah doesn't say that. Right, but, the, but he, yeah. he writes, but he writes, the menorah looked like yeah. this, yeah. kazeh, and then he puts the drawing there. He puts this, this drawing, is not. it was part of the halachas, it says, and the menorah looked like this picture that he himself drew. And this is, it's, this is clearly not uh, well, other, other an accident. It's quite, it's quite clear that this is, and the has all kinds of explanations and proof that this is the case, but that it's upside down. Not like Where's the upside down right triangle? Here, the all the cups, these, these triangles, are the cups? Oh, okay. So they're all facing with another. Wide. These are these are the cups here, I see. and all the knobs, all of the cups, yeah. the wider parts at the bottom, narrow yeah, at the top, yeah. in, implying that they're upside down. Right, right. right. From the drawing, but from the Gemara, it's quite much. It, the Gemara doesn't indicate either way, either way yeah. but the drawing looks quite specific. It's not like an accidentally like that. It looks quite specific that it's upside down, and there has other proofs like that as well. Okay. Yeah, from Russia, this is the Rambam's view. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is the Rambam's view I'm indicating here, not Rashi's view or anybody else's. It's the Rambam's view. Yeah, we should have, but we should have any mentioned any that the, cu- the cup is reverted, but that's, that's uh, the first to the drawing. It doesn't say either way. Yeah. The no, drawing no, is, no, it no. says it, it was kazel like this, and then there's very specific drawing. Are there any illustrations of Rashi's interpretation? Of no, just description. Just description between the Gemara here and his description on, on the Chumash, his commentary on the Torah itself. Okay, keep this here, we read it. Yeah, we'll keep the drawing here. It's confusing to see the, 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 uh, we'll get the numbers, all yeah. All the components together, the numbers. Yeah. So we are on Chafchesimut Beis, 28b. 
There's also quite a discussion about how the three cups were arranged. Were they three stacked, or were they on the, on the two and one in the slide? The art schools are all different cups. Yeah. yeah. It's not clear. Rashi and Amim's view, both of them, is that they were all stacked. Yeah, but there are... But let's, let, let's get, get to this. Um, we are... It's oh, okay. The line starts the word gimel. It's towards the, it's towards the bottom of the page. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines from the bottom of the page. The line begins with the letter gimel, and then five words in, you see the word vigavian. Mm-hmm. Vigavian. Now the cups. What did they look like? <coughs> Says the Gemara. Like Alexandrian cups, Egyptian Alexandrian cups. What is that? So Rashi says they were long and narrow. And he gives a French word. I don't know what the French word is. Maybe. Maybe Duranash. I'm not sure how to pronounce that in Old French. But the Raj, Rashi describes these Alexandrian cups as long and narrow. Whereas the Rambam says that they were just goblets. Not so narrow, I guess. They were wider at the, at the bay, wider at the edge. Like you see it, like you saw in the picture. It's an upside down triangle in the Rambam's picture. Narrow at the top and wide at the edge, whereas Rambam, whereas Rashi looks like it was long and narrowed all the way through, not so much wider at the end as, a, as in the base. Just slight variation. And then the Gemara goes on to say, Kaftarim, the knobs, the Mahim Diamond, what do they look like? Says the Gemara, Kimin Tapuche Hakartium. They look like apples, Corinthian apples, I think that's, a, that's what it is, Corinthian, with, it's some location which had apples come from that place. Now, by saying that, it doesn't really tell you much about the shape. There were apples that came from a certain location. What does that mean? So the truth is there are different versions of this Gemara here. And from the Ga'inim, it comes out that the apples referred to here are those that are taller than wider. So they're a little bit oval-like. And actually, Rambam in his description says that the Menorah the knobs looked like eggs. Kind of like, he says, kind of like eggs. And then they were narrower on the, at the width and mm-hmm. along the top, not, not, a, not a full ball. But it could be from Rashi's version, which is saying an apple from a certain location, it's an actual circle. Others say it refers to a pomegranate, in which case it's definitely uh, just a ball, a sphere. Okay. Prachim, the flowers, the mahim demon, what were they, what do they look like? Kimin prachim hamudim, like flowers of a beam. Rashi says they are flowers that one would etch, one would, they, I guess they would have like engravings on uh, beams, and that's what the flowers looked like. The Rambam says that they were flowers that were, pe- that were used in that era at the top of beams. And here, Rabbi Steinzatz, who's very good at this kind of stuff, has a picture of what beams looked like at the top of that time. So you can see it here. The top there is oh, the yeah. flowers at the top of the base. So, that's what it refers to in the Rambam's view. It's flowers they used to decorate beams with. It's Corinthian. Corinthian. Uh, no, the, uh, under it says from that era, sorry? Uh, yeah. The one on the top there, yeah? yeah, yeah. Okay. So there we have a description of what the flowers, knobs, and cup look like. The more then continues. The nimtu, the result of all this is, Gavian, the number of cups, is Esin Vishnayim. It's 22. We'll get to, in a moment, we'll get to how we get to that. And we'll use the picture then when we get there to see how we get to number 22 in a moment. Kaftar in the knobs. Achad 11 knobs total. Prachim flowers. Um, tisha, 9 flowers total. We're going to go through the count in a moment, breaking it down from the verses. Gemara then continues. Gvian, all of the cups, all 22 cups, ma'akvin zezeh, withhold each other. As we see this terminology with hold each other, we learned in the mission as well. And it's the Gemara's way of saying that you need all of them in order to fulfill the obligation. It's not as if each na, each cup is another mitzvah. And if I had 21 cups, that means I did 21 mitzvahs and I was lacking the 22nd mitzvah. No, it's one mitzvah to have all 22. So if you don't have all 22, you haven't fulfilled your obligation at all for having cups. It's as if they're not there. It's all one entity, one mitzvah, one obligation. Likewise, kaftaridim, the knobs, they hold, they withhold each other back. You need to have all 
How many is it? 11. All 11 knobs. Otherwise, you haven't filled your obligation for having knobs. Prachim, likewise, the flowers. You have to have all nine flowers. Ma'akvin says that they withhold each other, and if you don't have one of them, it's as if you're lacking all of them. And furthermore, Gvim kaftayidu prachim. The knobs, flowers, uh, the cups, knobs, and flowers, Ma'akvin says, all, all withhold each other. That is to say, the twen- all the cups, all the knobs, all the flowers are all one mitzvah. So if you were missing one knob or one flower, then it's as if you didn't have any of the cups, any of the flowers, or any of the knobs. It's all one mitzvah to have all of those components. But if you're lacking all of them, at least under extraneous circumstances, but the evidence might even be kosher. Menorah without, without these decorations. If it's, uh, if it's, gold, if it's made out of not gold, not gold yeah. right? Like gold. The, the times the Hashemunayim when they made it out of uh, iron that we learned uh, two days ago. Okay, now I think Mar is going to break down how we got to these numbers. I want to pass the book so we can look at the numbers as we go along with it. So Mar says like this: Bishlema, all is well with concerning Gviim with respect to the cups. Es and Mishnayim because we get to the number. 22. Why? Because it says, Uva Menorah, and in the Menorah here, it literally means candelabra, but here it means the, um, the central stem, I mean the stem of the candelabra. Our Bog Vim had a total of four cups. Right? So the stem had a total of four cups, one down here in this cluster, and three at the top. Okay, so we have four. The Ksiv in the verse reads, Shleisha Gavim Mushukadim, the Konachad, you have three cups. Uh, like stacked or on, on a slant on an angle in each of the in each of the branches so you have four in the central candelabra three in each branch so three times six is 18 plus four down the middle you have 22 so we got to the number so there's the verse is clear and after the the verse continues you have three uh, cups and a flower and a knob on each of the branches okay so that's how we get to 22 cups. So our body day, it itself, the, the central branch has four, the tamni, sari, and 18, the konim of the branches, three times six. Ha'esim you have a total of 22. Top of Chavtesa Madalaf, 29a. Now, Kavtarin, the knobs, nami achadaser, I can also easily get to, using the verses, I can get to 11 knobs. How so? Kaftarin did they, Kaftarin, the knobs themselves were tre did they, two of itself, as the verse says that it should have two, the shisha the konim, and six of each branch, right? Because we just quoted the verse before, which says that the central, that the, um, that each of the branches coming out should have three cups and a knob and a flower. So you know from there you have to have six knobs. Right? Plus it itself has it's two knobs. So the central, the central one has two knobs, one here in the cluster, and one at the top, its own decoration. Plus each of the s- six on either side, three on either side. So we have eight so far. Six from the side ones, and then eight. Right? But we still have to get to 11. We need three more. And then the verse says, the kafter, the kafter, the kafter. When the verse describes the branches that they come out of the central kind of as it says, and you should have a knob from which two branches come out, and another knob from which two branches come out, and another knob from which two branches come out. So it has its own two decorative knobs. It has six from the top of each of the other branches. And then the verse describes a knob, knob, knob from which the branches come out, making a total of 11. So the verse is clear about having 11. But, ala prachim, but the prachim, the flowers, this is more ambiguous. Tisha, the fact that we get to nine flowers, we know how'd you come to this conclusion? So let's break down what we have from the verses. Prachim diday, its own flowers from the central branch. Today, it has two of its own. That we know, just like we said before, we have two cups of its own, or at least, or four cups of its own, but we know it has two knobs of its own, so it also has two flowers, one at the cluster, and one at the top for its own decoration. Okay, so I know that it has to have two flowers. From the central branch, Vishisha the Kanim, and likewise the verse we quoted earlier, which said that each branch should have three cups and a flower and a knob, tells me that each branch should have a flower, making six and eight. Where's that last flower? Where's the last flower? So Tam Nahava, we have a conclude. We have a total of eight. eight, two of its own decoration, and one from each of the branches at the top, where the, where the verse described that should have 
uh, cups, knob, and flour, making a total of eight, and you told me that there's nine flowers. How did you get that nine flour? Says the Gemara, Amr of Shaman of Shaman explains. See if the verse reads, Ad Yircha Ad Pircha, that the that the branch should go to its base, to its flower. That's the flower the extra So therefore, the verse says that the, the the verse just said that the candelabra should go down to its base and its flower, implying that at the base there's another flower there, giving us the ninth flower. So here the Gemara substantiates each and every piece of decoration and the menorah from the various verses down to its number and details. Okay, now the Gemara tells us a little more about the about the menorah. Omar Rav, Rav tells us Goiva shel menorah, the height of the menorah is Tisha Tvachim is nine handbreadths. Very small. The Gemara says, Eisve, the Gemara challenges us and says, Eisve, Rav Simi Barchia, Rav Simi Barchia challenged the Rav to Rav. The verse tells us, we know, and the verse doesn't say, is there a verse that backs this up? No. The Gemara doesn't quote the verse here, but we know that Evan Heitz Lefnam Menorah, there was ten, there was a, a, a stone placed in front of the Menorah, Uba, and on it, Sholish Milas, there were three steps. Shala, upon which Hakayan Oymid, the, the Kayan would stand, Umaiti Vesaneris, and clean out the the cups of the candelabra and then light them. So you have a nine twachim high menorah in Rav's view. Nine twachim is lower than my waist. And then you guy had to get up on three steps to be able to clean it out. So they put it on a pedestal of some sort, right? Like the base on a pedestal. Then the menorah itself would be, be on the floor, right? It doesn't say that. Presumably it actually has to be on the floor. Does it? Yeah, well, isn't that the number that there can't be any chatzitza, there can't be any separation between the uh, floor and the, uh, the the floor of the temple and the uh, utens- vessels in the temple? So why would you need three steps if it's only nine twachim high? So on Malay, so Rav responded, see me, like my friend see me. Come on, you should have understood what I meant. At kika mina, you're asking this question. Kika mina, when I said that it's nine twachim, svas kan I meant from the point at which the branches go out. So you had nine twachim, it was a total of 18. Nine twachim from the base until the first knob where the branches come out. And from there to the top is nine. A total of 18. Let me ask you, how high is 18 twachim? Maybe... 18 hand breaths. How big is that? How many inches is that? Roughly. Each tefach is what, two inches? No. Maybe even less? No, 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 that's, that's, that's three amas. An arm is a foot and a half to two feet, so it's like four and a half to, to six feet. Eighteen tefachim. Yeah, because it's six tefachim. No, each tefach is an amma. Yes. Yes, six tefachim to an amma. That's right. So it's three ammas. So an amma is a foot and a half to two feet. So, so let's say it's we a foot. and twenty-one inches. Six inches. So, tw- so how 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 tall is eighteen tefachim? So it'd be like sixty-three inches, sixty-four inches, something like that. Sixty-four inches. Yes. Yeah, so and yet the kayan still needed three steps to get up there. Yeah. Why would he need three steps to get up there? It's not that tall either. Well, they shouldn't like, at least be able, be able to bend down because otherwise he's kind of... That's right, because part of the service is not just letting the menorah, and I alluded to this <laughs> earlier, it's mate of exactly. to clean out the menorah. Yeah, exactly. So to clean out the menorah, you have to be on top, on looking top, down. Looking down exactly. It's not enough just to be able, if it was just a menorah where he took a candle out and like that and cleaned it and lit it, yeah. he can have it much taller than himself. He sticks his hand up with the candle and lights them all. But part of the service is to clean it out every morning. So he had to, and we, you read in the morning, he lit two and he cleaned them out and while the other ones were lighting and the whole process of is cleaning out the that was the service it was actually cleaning out the lighting was easy cleaning it out and setting it up is the big deal so you have to be able to be on top of it looking down in which case the three steps uh, actually do serve a very functional purpose be able to stand above it look down and clean the whole thing out to be able to get it done I just want to clarify yeah talking, is that the size of no tefach is a hand breath hand that's an etzba tefach is no tefach, it, yeah it's a fist the fist it's supposed to be an average fist. Yeah. We, we, we went through this. Uh, when, when did we go through the details of this? One of the previous Gomorrahs, we went through the details of this. Our second talks about it. A share for a mikvah. Right. Our share of a mikvah go through the whole calculation. We went the calculation of the size of a human being. Four inches seem kind of high for that? Yeah. Sorry? The fist is four inches? It's the 
Average fist. Yeah. Maybe you have a big fist. No, I think I have a yeah. small one. I'm fist is four inches. It's quite yeah. big, actually. Yeah. Three and a half to four inches. That's right. Yeah. 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 We are, we're also a little liberal on it. In other words, because we, we, we want to go over the number instead of going under the number in most cases. But it could be smaller than we, than we imagine. I don't, I'm not oh, sure okay. exactly. But I'm resolved like from the elbow to the, the yeah, thing. Yeah. It's like a foot and a half to two feet as well. Yeah. Luckily, go like 22 inches, so it's like if that's 22 by three. Yard. So yeah, exactly. So it's like um, it's be like okay. five, five foot six yeah. inches. Okay, we're gonna stop over here because the Gemara now enters a whole new discussion uh, with respect to the history of the Minerva. Though we're a little early, but if we start this, we're gonna get a little bit uh, caught. So let's. We'll stop over here, and tomorrow, God willing, we have some history on the menorah. We mentioned this briefly the other day. We can't mention about uh, Shlomo Melech making ten menorahs. So we're going to go through the history of that, God willing, uh, tomorrow. Nice. Wonderful day. Oh,